Hello everyone and welcome to the Dry Eye Practice Fundamentals Roundtable. Uh, it is a real joy to have you with us today. Uh, this virtual event is being brought to you by the ophthalmologist. I am Fedra Pavlou, SVP and Editorial Director of the Ophthalmologist in New York. And before we get started, I wanted to offer our sincerest thanks to our headline sponsors, Sight Sciences, and to our affiliate sponsors, Bruda, Imprimis RX, Quidel, and Tarsus for making today's event possible. Thank you so much for your support. I am really excited to say that we have a, a fantastic panel of world-leading experts joining us today and ready to get the discussion started. It is a real joy to have you with us. We're so lucky to have you. Thank you. Um, and without further ado, I am going to introduce our, our wonderful moderator, Dr. Cynthia Matosian. Dr. Matosian is um, founder and medical director of Matosian Eye Associates in Mercer County, New Jersey and Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Dr. Matosian, it is a real pleasure to have you moderating our event. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna hand right over to you so that you can introduce our panel to our audience and to kick off the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And I am so fortunate to be surrounded by amazingly talented surgeons, physicians here. So I'm going to go to each one of you to introduce yourselves. Eric, let's start with you. Hi, Cynthia. Eric Donenfeld from Ophthalmic Consultants of Long Island. Absolutely a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you very much for making the time. Chris, let's go to you. Thank you, Cynthia, for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my name is Chris Starr. I'm uh, also in the New York area. I'm at Weill Cornell Medical Center, a cornea cataract refractive specialist. And Jay, let's go to you. Cynthia, thanks for having me. It's a great panel. And the ophthalmologist, thank you for your sponsorship for tonight. Uh, my name is Jay. I'm an anterior segment surgeon. I teach at the New York Eye and Ear. We have a large practice here at the Eye Care Consultants of New Jersey. Well, with that... We have um, not only amazing talent, but wonderful colleagues here. And we're going to talk about dry eye disease. Obviously, it is ubiquitous, as I say. So Jay, I'm going to start with you. Do you see dry eye patients in your practice? Do I see dry eye patients? <laughs> of course I see dry eye patients. That's good. You got the right um, answer. It's become a, a very big part of our, obviously, our medical practice. Um, it probably occupies in diagnosis codes up to, you know, 40 to 50% 50, 50 of all of our patients that we see either have primary dry eye or secondary dry eye. We also have a, a huge uh, cornea and glaucoma practice. And on the surgical front, you know, with all these great new lenses that have come out the last 15 months and getting plus 0 0.25 off the Iowa master or plus or minus 0 0.25 uh, measurements have become important. If you're not looking at dry eye, you're missing the boat. So both from a surgical lens and a medical lens, a dry is a huge part of our practice. And we're lucky to be in the middle of it here in Northern Jersey. Absolutely. Dry eye, as I say, is so common. Eric, I know you've done so many lectures on dry eye. So let's delve a little bit more. How do you define dry eye in your practice, Eric? Oh. Dry eye, uh, Cynthia, is really pretty difficult to, to just describe, but essentially an abnormality of, of the tear film in which the quality of the tears is abnormal and patients have dry eye symptoms associated with it. Uh, in general, in the past, we kind of looked at dry eye as just being aqueous deficiency, but now we realize that rubomian gland dysfunction plays a more significant role and is probably responsible for the great majority of dry eye we see in our practice. So it's when either aqueous deficiency or meibomian gland dysfunction, or most commonly both, mm -hmm. uh, occur in a patient that disrupts the normal quality of the tear film that creates dry eye symptomatology. Very well said. And Chris, I'm going to pivot to you. Clearly, you too see a lot of dry eye patients because you've been- I've never seen a dry eye patient, actually. <laughs> I, what, what is, what Somehow. Is, I don't 
believe that that is a true statement because you have been so involved in the dry eye movement from the get go, you know, being one of the contributors to the dry eye algorithm that ASCRS put together. So how do you define dry eye? What other comments would you add or um, kind of go off of what Eric and Jay have commented on so far? Well, as, as usual, I agree with everything that's been said, you know, that I uh, have a lot of respect for all three of you. And uh, I've learned a lot from all three of you over the years. And I tend to agree with with almost everything you guys say. Uh, and I, you know, to, but to, to go a little bit beyond that, I would like to say that, you know, dry eye, yes, is traditionally aqueous deficient and evaporative. And if you look at the TFOS dues two report, in fact, they say all dry eye becomes evaporative at some point in the past. Uh, so, you know, but that's dry eye disease. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions that, uh, and that has led to a lot of the frustration and confusion and all of the, the conundrum in this area is that there's ocular surface disease, which is very similar to dry eye disease, in fact, you know, with the similar symptoms and in some cases signs. And there are a lot of subtypes of ocular surface disease that is mislabeled as dry eye disease and treated as dry eye disease. And that leads to patients being frustrated because they have some other condition that sounds like dry eye disease, but isn't. So I agree with Eric, dry eye disease, aqueous deficient and evaporative mostly, but there are so many other subtypes that coexist with it. Rarely does dry eye disease live in a vacuum with no other forms or subtypes of ocular surface disease. And it behooves us as clinicians to try to find dry eye disease and, and grade it and assess its, you know, whether it's evaporative, right? But also to find the other subtypes of OSD that are contributing to that patient's symptoms and treat them all. You know, That's I, a I'm big challenge, right isn't it? <laughs> so, so Eric, go ahead. Cynthia, if you, if you mind, um, what what was just said by Chris is really very important in that we so commonly diagnose people with dry eye and many times it's not aqueous deficiency or evaporative dry eye. It's actually some other form of ocular surface disease. And one of the most greatest frustration that physicians and patients have is that we treat dry eye and their symptoms don't get better because we're not treating the underlying ocular surface disease that so commonly coexists with dry eye. And the biggest issue that I have in patients who return to our practice who haven't responded to therapy is that we're treating the wrong disease. So Jay, how do we start teasing this apart? Chris, we'll come back to you shortly because you mentioned you, there are so many other coexisting diseases. So Jay, but let's start with you. If you have somebody in your office, how do you start diagnosing and, and figuring out what exactly is going on. Sure. <clears throat> so there's no doubt, I agree with yet again, all of you, um, but this discussion is really evolving and this is a, uh, a sophisticated problem, but a pretty simple diagnosis. So I just go back to the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm, but also listen to the patient. So our texts are a very big part of diagnosing dry eye, teasing it out of the patients. And we all check vision as our, as our pulse, our heart rate, as our vital sign and eye care. And if that vision is fluctuating, every patient now is screened for fluctuating vision, every patient. And if someone's 20, 40, 20, 50, sometimes if it's a post-op patient or patient coming in for a, a cataract eval, um, we will put a tear in it. That, and if that vision gets better after a couple of minutes, for sure there's some kind of fluctuating vision. And patients now complain, when I'm on the computer, especially with COVID and the exacerbation of uh, the ocular surface, blepharitis, MGD with the mask, and this poorly ventilated system around the ocular surface, that's where we make literally two thirds of our diagnosis. Our techs uh, in a digital format do a really good job at teasing that out. I go in the room, I'm smiling, rather loquacious, looking at the patient, look for signs, look for lid abnormalities, look for hyperemic lids, look for telangiectasias, you know, overt MGD, uh, look at the conjunctiva, is it hyperemic? And then obviously when I'm at the sit lamp, I will use tear breakup time, tear meniscus, and then some of the exotic stains with fluorescein, rarely Rose Bengal. I like Rose Bengal academically, 
when I'm teaching at the New York Eye Ear, for sure we talk about it all the time, but I'm a big fluorescein guy. I just look at the quality of the tear film and the ocular surface, as Chris mentioned so well, begins at the level of the lids. It actually begins at the level of the skin. And you talked a lot about cosmetics causing dry eye and mm -hmm. ocular surface issues at the level of the skin, the lid margin, the different conjunctivas, and then obviously the cornea and then the central cornea. And we, we're, we're pretty good at it. We're, we're, I'd say we're 90% good at it. And if someone's coming in with these comorbidities, blepharitis, contact lens overwear, polypharmacy because of glaucoma drops, we search pretty hard uh, and pretty quickly for dry eye. And we do a pretty good job at it. But we're looking for it and we're ready for it. We're just ready for that next blizzard here. I think we're all in the Northeast actually between <laughs> all of us in New York, New Jersey. We're ready for that blizzard. And it's a very, very important part of what we do right now in eye care. I think Jay, you hit something right on the head and that is that you are open to it and you are looking for it. Unfortunately, many doctors are not open to it and they don't approach the patient with that kind of mindset. Therefore, a lot of dry eye patients are being A, not diagnosed or just being passed on from you know doctor to doctor. So I wanna go to you, Chris, because you made the point of um, saying often there are coexisting issues on the ocular surface. So how do you assess the surface when you see a patient and how do you figure out how, what else is going on and do they indeed have dry eye or what other comorbidities are, are occurring? Yeah, that's, you know, it's, um, it's complicated and it's, you know, somewhat time consuming. Um, and it usually involves as it ha always has been signs and symptoms and symptoms are important. And if you really talk, as, as Jay was saying, you kind of we talk to the patient get a feel for what their main complaint is, but also what the second, third, and fourth complaints are, because a lot of times that will help guide you. We always fixate on irritation or whatever the one kind of complaint is, but there are usually multiple ones that can sort of lead you. And of course, you know, validated questionnaires are useful in, in any you know, serious practice, whether it's, you know, speed or OSDI, or in the case of the pre-op patient, the Ascaris uh, questionnaire that we created for that purpose specifically. Uh, and then I do think that, you know, uh, objective diagnostic tests are very useful in the modern era. And a lot of people will poo-poo diagnose, oh, I don't need that. I don't need osmolarity. I can, you know, tell from, and, and in, in obvious cases, that is true. You know, you don't always need diagnostic tools to help, but they are very useful. And in these sort of murkier patients that are less obvious, they are incredibly useful at ruling people in and ruling people out and, and making these diagnoses of the various subtypes. So um, in my practice, the protocol is sort of osmolarity and MMP9 are sort of the key triggers in patients who have an ocular surface related symptom. And that, you know, as we all know, it could be any number of ocular surface, common ocular surface symptoms that are common to all the subtypes of ocular surface disease. Uh, and so those two tests, and this, we talked about this in our, in the Ascaris algorithm paper, that was the screening battery that we thought was uh, essential uh, for these pre-op patients. But in essence, that algorithm uh, uh, pr uh, project really is useful to any, whether it's a pre-op patient or not, it's a pretty useful I think ocular surface disease protocol for any practice and any patient, whether they're having surgery or not, because the, the combination of the symptoms, and let's not forget a lot of patients don't have symptoms. You know, Priya Gupta and I published a paper in the pre-op cataract patient where 85% of patients who had zero symptoms on a validated questionnaire had abnormal osmolarity and MMP9. So they clearly an ocular surface dysfunction but without symptoms. And, you know, there, that's an, another whole hour webinar to, trying to figure out why these patients that could be our fine. next one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We could do neurotrophic keratitis, you know, stoicism, whatever you want to, you know, in those older patients, they don't complain as much for various reasons, but um, that's why these tests are very important, you know, at identifying the sort of subtle, non-obvious, uh, but potentially visually significant ocular surface subtypes uh, that may or may not be dry eye disease or exist, coexist with dry eye disease. So osmolarity, I think, is a great test for dry eye disease, linearly related to the severity, 
and it tells you a lot about dry eye disease. MMP9, on the other hand, is fantastic for dry eye disease too. And in fact, that was what it was FDA approved for, uh, the elevated inflammation in dry eye disease. But you know, MMP9 is a very nonspecific marker of ocular surface dysfunction or disease, now, whatever D word you, you prefer. But if it's positive, there's something wrong with the ocular surface. And if osmolarity is normal, let's say, but MMP9 is abnormal, well, maybe that's a, one of these masqueraders or co you know, and this is also leading to a lot of the confusion in this area is that what is, we, we all have different terms. Dry eye disease, is it dysfunctional tear syndrome or dry? So uh, is, is a non-dry eye uh, ocular surface subtype uh, a co-conspirator or a masquerader or a non-dry eye subtype of, of OSD? You know, I, who knows? But, you know, we all, you know, we're all on the same page. We know what we're talking about, but we don't have unified terms for these things. But nonetheless, I, I'm digressing, but we have an hour. Uh, osmolar a normal osmolarity and an abnormal MMP9 could tell you, well, there's something wrong with that ocular surface. M you know, it's inflamed. We all know that inflammation is, uh, you know, a marker of some dysfunction or disease. So if their MMP9 is positive, you know, whether the patient's complaining or not, or the eye's bright red or not, that there is something wrong with that ocular surface and it behooves you with your other tests or your exam or both to figure out what that is. And in the pre-op patient, whether or not it's visually significant and it's gonna to lead to a problem post-operatively, which of course is viewed as a complication by patients. Um, an, an Iowa, a, a suboptimal visual quality with a multifocal, a refractive miss, or in the case of an infectious subtype of OSD, that's not dry eye disease, but a, a subtype of OSD, that could lead to endophthalmitis if it's, you know, bacterial anterior blepharitis or what have you. So there are a lot of potential repercussions and complications that can uh, occur if you don't sort of pay attention to this preoperatively with uh, a protocol in the office. Very well said, Chris. And, you know, I always learn so much from all of you. And Eric, what you've taught me is to assess fluctuations in vision. So what I've learned from that, and I've incorporated wholeheartedly in our practice, but we used to use the word fluctuate. And then we realized that some of our patients did not know what the word fluctuate meant. And they were too embarrassed to ask about it. So they'd say no, just as a defensive kind of response. So when we changed to, to does your vision change throughout the day, all of a sudden we were getting a lot more yeses. So now we don't say, does your vision fluctuate? We say, does your vision change throughout the day? And our response has been phenomenal. So Eric, um, going back to you, uh, once you've kind of teased apart what's going on, do you have a specific treatment algorithm with which you start? And then we're going to go around and kind of uh, ask you, Jay, and then ask you, Chris, how you start to treat and how you build on that treatment. So Eric, um, you have the mic. Sure, Cynthia. So the key to treating dry eye is diagnosing it correctly. And I think in the past, we've, we've not differentiated enough between aqueous deficiency and meibomian gland dysfunction or, or evaporative dry eye. And I very much like to establish the diagnosis using some of the tests that Chris has told us about. Um, my testing that I, that I, that I use um, will, involves actually looking at the lids. I think we don't look at the lids enough and Looking from a bombing gland dysfunction, you can just squeeze the lid as based on the ASCUS algorithm and look for the discharge. Um, also, kind of hiding in plain sight, we're learning that there's a, another diagnosis that's associated with dry eye, and that's demodex blepharitis that, that causes significant dry eye symptoms as well. So have a patient look down and, and look for signs of demodex in the lids. You'll see collarettes, which are waste from the mice, and they're just pathognomonic. Um, but to go to answer your question, Cynthia, what I like to do is to make the diagnosis and then I base my treatment on the diagnosis. If a patient I believe has predominantly aqueous deficiency, dry eye, such as a patient with Sjogren's syndrome, there's a patient that I'm going to start with artificial tears, move to non-preserved tears. And here is where I like to use immunomodulation as a primary therapy. And I, I've liked cyclosporin in the past. Um, right now, I 
kind of tend to more use uh, lifidograst or Zydra. And I will pre-treat my patients with a corticosteroid, usually feeling that that combination immunomodulation makes the patient more comfortable. Patients don't like therapies that don't provide rapid relief and cause uh, irritation, foreign body sensation. And unfortunately, both cyclosporin and lifidograst both have very high incidence of irritation, and they also um, don't respond immediately. So by adding that topical corticosteroid, I think you've gone a long way. And in the past, we've published on the use of uh, lodopredinol, and there's a new lodopredinol available from a company called Shire called Isuvis, which is a 0.2% um, uh, corticosteroid that is a nanotechnology, gets great penetration. And I will combine that usually four times a day. Now it's indicated for flares of dry eye, but the way I use it is I use it for uh, instigating uh, therapy. And I use that maybe two to four times a day for a month and I'll stop it after a month and I will use uh, the lifidograss twice a day. And that's kind of my primary therapy for aqueous deficiency. Um, I will very commonly add oral um, nutritional supplements. I'm a big believer in uh, omega-3 fish oils, so I'll add that as well. Punctal plugs come down the line as well. If I think the patient has meibomian gland disease, again, I start with tears. Uh, and here, I, I will go to hot compresses. Um, I think it's more important to use nutrition in these patients. Mm -hmm. um, and very commonly, patients don't actually do the hot compresses. That's one of the great uh, problems I have is patients being non-compliant with therapy. So here, um, I love the use of blepharo exfoliation. Um, this is a, a technique of removing the biofilm from the lid with a company called Blefex. Very simple, very easy to use. And then I follow it with thermal pulsation. There are a variety of different companies that use thermal pulsation. Uh, Tear Science um, has a wonderful treatment. Uh, Alcon has Ilux and Johnson & Johnson uh, has Lipaflow. So all these treatments work very well uh, together. And I find that patients really get a boost out of using those therapies. So that's kind of my overview. And very commonly patients have both diseases, in which case I kind of combine both of these therapies we've just discussed. Eric, that was a very comprehensive response. The Isuvis is a product by Cala, just to uh, get clarification on Oh, did I say something else? <laughs> you said Shire, so we oh. need to nix the one. Okay. Let's that, go to, um, but let's go to so Cala. Let's, Isuvis let's, let's, is by Cala, not by Shire. Let's but, correct that. Okay. Okay. Um, so I agree that I too, like Chris, Jay, and you, Eric, look at MMP9 whether it's positive, and I actually grade it significantly positive, moderately positive, or slightly positive. I kind of put that gradation on it. And I look at tear osmolarity and I look at it over time, just like you mentioned, Jay and Chris, and you also, Eric, it's not an absolute number. It's a trend. Is the number coming down or is it going up? And that also tells me if the patient is being non-compliant, it kind of gives me a clue. So with that, um, Jay, based on these diagnostic tests and the queries that your technicians do for the patients, how is your treatment algorithm similar or different than the one Eric just mentioned? It's very similar to Eric's. Uh, why would it not be? <laughs> um, Eric's been a great uh, leader in the field and we've all listened to him over the years and decades. Um, we're very similar. The only difference is, and I'm sure he does the same thing as well, that we can't throw everything at the same time with the patient. So it would be malpractice to see these patients and have them come back in one year. We treat these patients just like glaucoma or bad diabetic retinopathy. We see them over the course of time. We make the diagnosis the first visit. We'll start off with an emollient, which with, with, for both algorithms works very well. Once it's MGD or evaporative, we then put them on a, a, on a paradigm of treatment and we create an axis of treatment over the next couple of months. Hopefully they're getting better. They usually get better every time, but they don't get better enough. The immunomodulators are great. If we don't use steroids um, and behavioral modification plus an emollient, um, what happens is, is these patients often lag with the immunomodulators and we use a steroid to help hasten the recovery or the benefit for both induction therapy 
and mitigation of some of the side effects from the cyclosporin and the lofitograst, as Eric uh, stated so well. So we do exactly the same thing. Patient comes in, tech intervention, our intervention, both ophthalmologic and optometric, we're now called, called eye care, and all of our providers do a pretty good job in how we treat the patients. Some will space the visits out every six weeks for, till they're better, uh, every three months till they're better, and most of these patients get seen two or three times a year. Not one patient complained during COVID to come in or do a telehealth, and not one patient complains about the copay of seeing them a couple of times a year. It's because they were ignored by the neighboring practice and only seen once a year to go figure out their own artificial tear at CVS or Walgreens, that therein lied the difference. You would never isolate the glaucoma patient to go to CVS and Walgreens, get your generic you know, prostaglandin and see you back in the year. You do gonioscopy, visual fields, OCT, and due amount of time during that journey. So everything that Eric said for sure, um, and Chris with the diagnostics, but we really splayed out over time. That way the patient's not obtunded with so much information and so much diagnosis at the same time. And we allow the, we allow the effect of, the, of the, the, the intervention to play out, which takes sometimes more than a couple of weeks. Um, Jay, you're a little frozen right now, so I'm going to jump in. I love the analogy between dry eye and glaucoma because both are chronic diseases. Both of them require multiple modalities, both in office procedures and at home remedies. So Chris, based on what you heard Jay and Eric mention, are there any additional treatment options that you incorporate for your patients? Uh, you know, um, I, you took the words out of my mouth, but by the way, the glaucoma analogy is brilliant and uh, very appropriate because they are very similar. You know, they, they, they were long-term care, chronic disease, pretty much incurable diseases, but can be controlled and monitored over time and treated. And, you know, it requires a lot of visits, like Jay said, but also a lot of diagnostic uh, data uh, that not only, you know, helps you as a, as a clinician to make the right diagnosis and grade the severity and, and, and a, it helps you determine what your, how aggressive your regimen is going to be just like in glaucoma. But Cynthia, one of the things that you said before was that you, the, one of the useful, um, uh, utilities of the diagnostic test is that you can gauge patient compliance based on where these tests are going. And the flip side of that is these tests actually help to engage patients in their care, and it increases their compliance when they are involved with these numbers. Just like in diabetics, they all know what their A1C is. Hypertensives know what their blood pressure is, and they, you know, the next visit they ask the doctor, "What's the number today? Is it did it come down? Is the is the medication working?" And I find that the same kind of patient involvement, uh, I see that with these ocular surface patients, in whom I get these diagnostic tools and they're aware of what their osmolarity is and MMP9 is even easier because it's either positive or negative. And they're like, is it, you know, what is it today? You know, doctor. So I think that that helps them stay on track uh, and it gets them more involved. And a lot of times our treatment regimens, as everyone has said, can be you know, obtunding, as, as Jay said, you know, you, you see somebody for the first time, especially these patients who were there for like their third or fourth opinion, right? This, you know, in New York City, we see that all the time because it's so easy to get multiple opinions because we're all within a, a few, a mile of a each few other. blocks of each other. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'll just get, you know, the next door down, I'll see what this guy says. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, we see these patients who have been undertreated or mistreated uh, by doctors a lot of the time and they're suffering and they feel frustrated and they have real advanced disease and they're on maybe a preserved artificial tear only, maybe a warm compress, uh, and they're suffering and they're getting worse. And so in those patients, you really do want to treat pretty aggressively up front, whether they're surgical or not, you know, that every patient with advanced disease deserves that sort of multifaceted, aggressive kind of treatment. And that usually involves multiple things all at once. And it can be overwhelming to these patients, but you know, the, that combination of a steroid, uh, 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 warm compress and immunomodulator, maybe a plug if they're not inflamed, 
uh, all kind of up right up front. Um, you know, we'll get them better as quickly as possible, and that is going to lead to satisfaction. And these patients finally breathing a sigh of massive relief. Finally, you know, somebody is taking this seriously. Yeah. I'm suffering. I've been suffering for years. My quality of life is down. Work productivity is down. You know, some of these patients are despondent. They're depressed. They're in some cases suicidal. Uh, so, you know, to, to take these patients seriously it, and, and the reward as a clinician and as, as a physician is uh, in, in some, some cases um, equal to that reward that we get when we take out a, you say, a white cataract or do a keratoprosthesis prosthesis on somebody who, you know, was light perception and had lost hope, you know, and to get these patients improved is, you know, and dry eye can be just as profound as those other surgical things that we get so much reward from. So, you know, I think it behooves everybody to, you know, to take this seriously. That's what, you know, all this education that we do, and this is not the first time that the four of us have done this and, and our colleagues, we do this a lot and the message is getting across, but uh, it it is, it's a great service. And this is why we, you know, do what we do, you know, to, to help people. And these patients I find, are low-lying fruit. You know, these patients are suffering. They're, they're dying for, and so being aggressive and, and adding all these things, yes, it can be overwhelming, but it works. And that's what we want. And we want to get them feeling better as quickly as possible. Very well said. And I agree that the diagnostic testing of MMP9 and tear osmolarity, and I also do my biography to show my patients the anatomy of their gland structure is never once and done. It's something that I repeat, especially the MMP9 and tear osmolarity to demonstrate um, treatment effectiveness. We know, Eric, that chronic disease um, equals non-compliance very often because patients don't like to do something forever. And we're asking our patients actually to do a lot of things. We have often a laundry list of do this, 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 and this. So how um, do you get your patients to become compliant? Like what are some of the tricks that you use, Eric, to help them stay the course? Well, dry is a chronic lifelong disease and uh, there's no cure for it yet. We're certainly looking for that. And, and there's a lot of hope coming with a lot of new medications in the pipeline. But I've found that over time that almost for everything that involves chronic medications, I like to take the treatment as much as I can out of the patient's hands and put it in the hands of the physician. I, I think that any treatment that you can offer a patient that involves the physician providing the therapy is going to be advantageous. So um, I think explaining the patient the nature of the disease, finding easy solutions is good, but I happen to like blepharoexfoliation and thermal pulsation as two of the best primary therapies that last six months to a year and give patients a lot of relief. So that's become kind of the, the benchmark for a lot of the things that I do. Um, after that, everything else involves chronic therapy. There's nothing else that you can tell a patient to do um, that, that we can do for them. So the, the medications, the topical drops, they're all very important. But again, finding therapies that, are, that minimize their, their time is really important. Asking a patient to do hot compresses every day for five or 10 minutes, almost no one does that. Um, but you can't ask a patient to take a drop in the morning and at night before they go to sleep which is a perfect time to take a corticosteroid or an immunomodulator. Um, but in my experience, telling patients in a simple way what their disease is, explaining to them and making them understand that their therapy is going to be what determines how they feel and that the control of their dry is really in their hands and making them responsible for doing that therapy, I find very important. And that's why the first visit that I have with a patient who comes in with dry is probably one of my longer visits in my office because I need to explain to them the nature of the disease, the different therapeutic options, and how important it is that they participate in their care. 
Very well said. Now, Jay, um, I agree with you, Eric, and I'm going to go to Jay in a minute. Um, the only difference that I explain to my patients, I agree, they don't like having a washcloth bending over the sink, trying to put, you know, warm compresses on their eye. Instead, what I recommend, which I have found to be pretty successful in my practice, is the heated moisture mask. Um, the one I recommend is from Bruder and it stays hot long enough after it's been heated for 20 seconds in the microwave. And actually my patients really like using it before sleeping because it kind of relaxes them. So that one often becomes a popular item. So Jay, we know that MGD is one of the you know, main causes of um, ocular surface disease. Do you offer impromptu treatments in the office for these patients? Do you schedule them to come back? How do you like figure out to whom to offer a procedure on the spot and for whom to recommend a treatment? And what are some of the treatments that you recommend for MGD? So again, I do believe, believe in the warming of lids for sure. I think MGD is still underdiagnosed. A lot of folks that think they are sophisticated think everyone has evaporative. And as you go that decision tree, there may be some overlap, but if patients aren't getting better, chances are there's MGD. And as Eric said, you probably have not spent time examining the lids. So again, let's go back to the analogy of glaucoma. And when do you offer more drops? When do you offer SLT? When do you offer MIGs if they have cataract or no cataract disease? Well, it's such a great time in glaucoma to have all these things in our armamentarium. So there's an aspect on dry eye, which I call interventional dry eye, and we'll do all the things you've spoken about. And again, we haven't spoken about plugs here, but we don't plug the first time we see them. <clears throat> if the tear film is inflamed, uh, the tear osmolarity is out of whack, if the MMP is out of whack, we take time to help mitigate the inflammatory burden on the ocular surface. Then we'll plug up that good quality tear film versus the bad tear film. <clears throat> if MGD is a big part of this, yeah, you could use a hot spoon or a warm compress. That's not sustainable. We always use Bruder mask for sure. Um, we sell dozens of those every week in our practice. But at that point in time, if the patient's still not getting better, you look at the lids, there's dropout of the nabobian glands and so forth, they need something more. There's a lot of cool technologies out there we are big fans of, uh, of Sight Sciences tear care system. It's really easy to use. The techs love it. The cost burden is not high for either the practice or the patient. And we offer that on average one time a year. Sometimes people eat blueberries and drink coffee after teeth whitening and they need another treatment in three or four months. Maybe 20% of our patients get some kind of warming and clearing of the lids uh, twice a year. But more often than not, They'll get once a year of these treatments. Uh, again, it's affordable. We do 20 minutes of warming, five minutes of clearing, led by the surgeon and or the optometrist. Patients do very well, but we don't abdicate the behavioral modification, the immunomodulators, the emollients, and the steroids PRN. Again, it truly takes a village in taking care of the ocular surface. And when you start thinking about MGD in a precocious way, more often than not, your success rate for overall dry eye will be 90% plus. And like oncology or heart surgery, you're not gonna be successful in 100% of your patients, 100% of their times. But if you can make them better than what they've done before, therein lies you know, the sweet spot. And again, so we've gone to more of an interventional aspect uh, the last several years, a lot more during COVID. People have some expendable dollars and we're able to afford them, you know, an interventional aspect to dry eye like we have for glaucoma. Very well said. And Chris, one of the um, acronyms that you came up with is LLPP. So maybe you can tell us about that in conjunction with blepharitis. And Eric alluded to the colorette. So let us know what LLPP stands for <laughs> and what you're looking it. for. Yeah, so you know, so uh, we were talking about this sort of algorithm protocol before, and that upfront involves some of the diagnostic tests that is usually done by technicians. And I, and I think you know every practice is different, and some practices do a lot, some do none. 
uh, and some do it somewhere in between. So, you know, our practice osmolarity MMP9 is fundamental. Um, and then mybography, usually in somebody with known MGD or high suspicion or somebody who's following up and I put in the note, you know, get my biography next time or non-invasive to your breakup um, uh, or an OCT of the meniscus, those types of things can be done. But, you know, with all these fancy algorithms and all these fancy diagnostic tests, which I think are useful, nothing will ever keep you from doing an exam, right? We, the exam is, fun to, is, is the most fundamental thing that we do. Everybody has to do an exam. It doesn't have to take a long time. The discussion always takes a long time, as Eric said, but <laughs> the exam doesn't have to take a long time. And the LLPP was just kind of uh, my little sort of way of, of, of the little mnemonic for helping people kind of remember what is fundamental to the ocular surface exam. And the LLPP stands for look, lift, pull, and push. You, you look, of course, you look at the ocular surface, the, the, the eyelashes, the, 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 the lid margin, conjunctiva, the interpalpebral, um, uh, cornea and conch. And then the lift is lift up the upper lid, okay? Because this is something that is easy to do. It takes a second, but is often not done. And a lot of pathology is missed if you're not lifting up the upper lid and looking at the superior cornea, the superior conjunctiva. There's a lot of stuff up there. And in the case of the pre-op patient, EBMD is up on that superior cornea a lot of the times and can lead to irregular astigmatism and IOL issues if you're not if you don't find it. Uh, but then very importantly, the uh, the LL look lift and then pull, which is kind of assessing lid laxity. The, the floppy eyelid syndrome and, and eyelid laxity issues is another one of these sort of simple things that is one of these subtypes of ocular surface disease that we were talking about in the beginning that's not dry eye disease, has very different treatment and very different source of symptoms, uh, but uh, is often called dry eye because you don't lift, you don't assess laxity. But, you know, so that's the, the, the pull part of it. And then push. My Bohmian gland expression. Again, very fun. You don't, you know, I think my biography is very useful and non-invasive tear breakup time is very useful, but, you know, pushing on uh, a my Bohmian gland and expressing the gland takes all of a half a second and gives you almost as useful information as those tests will give you. Uh, and it's free. You just use your finger and touch or a Q-tip. As or, long as you have a slit lamp, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you need a slit lamp for that. Yeah. But and there's um, so much you can see, right? By looking at the base of the lashes, Chris. And if you see that pathognomonic ring, it means what? Uh, you mean the collarette? Yeah, the collarette. Yes, yes. So the so the certainly a collarette at the base of the lash is pathognomonic for demodex, demodex, with however you say it. Um, I usually usually say demodex, but that is demodex blepharitis until proven otherwise. And you actually don't need to prove it otherwise anymore because you know you know no nobody needs to pluck lashes and look at under microscopes anymore because the studies show that that is pathognomonic for demodex blepharitis. And there has been some talk, you know, be, what you could make the argument that by looking down in our LLPP, it was look, look, and then lift up. But by having the patient look down, usually those collarettes are much more identifiable on the upper lid and much easier seen by looking down. So maybe we'll adjust that mnemonic to the LLL. <laughs> Don't look make up, it too down. complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because we're uh, fortunate that a new product is going yes. to be available shortly. Eric, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Well, Tarsus has a product called Lodaliner, which is a neurotoxin that's specific to uh, to mites, Demodex. And you know, I kind of thought that that mites were something that was just a commensal organism that really didn't really cause much damage but the results of the tarsal tarsal studies uh, uh recent ones that were just published the phase three trials really point to overwhelming uh evidence that demodex plays a very significant role in dry eye disease and you know for decades we've noticed that it's there we never really paid much attention to it but the results of these trials are uh, extremely positive and we're looking forward to having fda approval of this drug hopefully uh in 2023 or so um, and it, it, it's very well tolerated, and the, the trials um, results are just outstanding. So that's just one of the new, very exciting drugs that's coming to us 
for managing dry eye disease. We're very excited to have that um, as one of the products in our armamentarium to treat dry eye. Jay, one of the things that we have heard about is that that dreaded phone call back from the pharmacy saying that the patient's insurance does not cover or that their copay is so high the patient is refusing a branded, let's say, immunomodulator. When you hit a roadblock like that, what alternatives do you turn to to help the patient get some relief? That's a great question and the biggest conundrum in practice management. Uh, we assume everyone gets all the products we prescribe um, and it's really, really tough, especially for those of us that have a poly approach or a poly pharmacy. Um, you know, sometimes it takes a lot of drops to control pressure. It takes a lot of approaches to take care of the ocular surface. So you're right. A lot of the insurance companies want to see stepwise therapy. A lot of the insurance companies won't, won't cover branded therapy. Now you have generics and an emollient or some kind of solution that hasn't been tested uh, with the FDA and, and great thoughtful, you know, phase three pivotal trials. And now you're doing more harm than good. So if all else fails, we, you know, try to give patients samples for the short-term therapies, but how much samples can you get, especially this time of the year when we're all busy, but, you know, um, inventory for these companies is really little and uh, so forth. How many coupons can you give out, right? Um, it's just really, oh, sorry. It's just really, it's really interesting. <laughs> Cute dog. So, you know, we'll, we'll do, we'll, we'll do everything possible. Sometimes we have to switch from restasis to lefitigras, this steroid to that steroid, generics and so forth. Uh, it is truly a circus act. Um, I'm not going to give you the solution here. We don't really have the greatest solution. We do have sharpshooters in the practice that will help the patients. I always have two full-time staff that deal with callbacks and pre-authorization. It's a pain, but again, uh, we took the Hippocratic Oath to take care of patients. And the worst part of the practice is dealing with this. So we'll, we'll, we are very open to all the companies, all the solutions. Uh, some of the pharmacies uh, are very tough with us. They'll try to help us out. They'll do pre-authorization themselves. Companies like Imprimis uh, and so forth have other you know, cash only modalities for patients that are actually cheaper than some of the products we've talked about. And oftentimes with 30, 40, 50 bucks for monthly therapy, if the therapy works, the patient will use it. So mm -hmm. we use all of the above, whatever tactic it takes. Um, there are some companies that have free, you know, if you meet a, a certain threshold of not poverty, but you can't afford things. Some of the companies have some programs and we applaud them for that. But again, the majority of patients don't qualify for that. So it's a frustrating time. Uh, in healthcare for that. Uh, and now the donut hole, you know, Medicare Part D patients, it gets very, very tough. So we look to other companies, other alternatives that have other programs, including cash only at a much lower threshold than some of the branded products held by some of the bigger pharmaceutical companies. And sometimes you're exactly right, Jay. We do go to the compounded pharmacies to get that cash pay alternative because it sometimes is less expensive than the copay right. that the patient has to pay or if they're in that donut hole or if they happen to be a Medicare patient and cannot kind of benefit from some of the available coupons. Chris or Eric, did you want to add any points to that? The, like the roadblocks that we hit when we're recommending products for our patients. Good. Let's talk a little bit about preservatives and, um, and their role in um, the products that we recommend. Some of them, of course, have preservatives in them, and we know that they exacerbate the ocular condition. So do you purposely, Chris, select non-preserved products when available? Uh, the short answer is yes. I, uh, uh, certainly with over-the-counter uh, stuff. Um, I almost always recommend preservative free because I, I know that, especially in the case of artificial tears, and usually I'll try to guide the patient as Jay was talking about earlier, just sort of guiding patients and telling them sort of specifically what, which uh, product you want them to get, which will work best for their condition. Uh, I like the lipid uh, containing artificial tears and especially the preservative free ones. Uh, because in those, especially in patients who have very severe disease, I know that they're going to be using that drop a lot. And I usually tell them, 
that you, you know, can use this as often as you have symptoms throughout the day, as long as it's preservative free, you know, feel free to, to treat those symptoms all day long if you need to. And, and then I want to kind of know what that number is. I, I actually, that's another metric that we didn't talk about, but the, the use of artificial tears helps guide my next step uh, a lot of the time in these patients. So if somebody says I'm taking these drops every 30 minutes uh, and I'm still suffering, well, then I'm going to bump up the treatment at the next visit, whether it be plugs or, you know, starting an immunomodulator if you're not already on one or a steroid or what have you, uh, or one of the procedurals. Um, but uh, yes, the preservative free is my standard go-to recommendation and virtually everybody at this point. Mm -hmm. Eric, what about you? Do you make a conscientious choice to select a preservative free option if um, a drug comes in both? Well, the answer is obviously yes. Um, the immunomodulators really only come non-preserved, so that makes it really very easy. Um, um, but there's a lot of new therapies we have. And it's been brought up earlier that probably the biggest difficulty that I have is managing a patient who has concomitant glaucoma and dry eye. And the glaucoma medications themselves, as well as the preservative, just wreak havoc on the ocular surface. So um, using a non-preserved glaucoma product makes a big difference. But I have found patients who have really had problems getting them off the glaucoma drops, either doing an SLT or a um, uh, Allergan has a new insert that goes into the eye uh, and relieving the patient from the burden of eye drops can really help uh, these patients significantly. So the answer is, is yes, I, I, I really enjoy non-preserved uh, medications. Certainly uh, we have a lot of them that are available to us today. And for any chronic medication, this is the way to go. Probably the biggest advance that I've had in managing my dry eye in my surgical population is the use of a uh, dexamethasone insert that goes into the punctum that's indicated for uh, corticosteroid use after cataract surgery. It's called Dextenza from Ocular Therapeutics. And the uh, unexpected result is that you're giving patients chronic corticosteroids for about a month, which is non-preserved. And there's just nothing better for the ocular surface than doing that. So um, for patients who have concomitant dry eye and are having cataract surgery, I think that's a good course to use as well. They also just got an indication to treat um, ocular allergies, allergic conjunctivitis. So in patients who have dry eye and ocular allergies, it's a great combination because it's a win-win for the allergies and the dry eye. Jay, just a little while ago, you alluded to the impact that COVID has had on dry eye. Tell us a little bit more about that. What have you noticed? Well, I think 98% uh, of us, especially here in New York, New Jersey, were down by 98% in volume in the office. Most of us kept our offices open during the, the outskirts of, uh, of COVID. Uh, only for a few hours a day, a couple of emergencies, maybe some retina patients and so forth. Surgery is pretty much obliterated. What kept us buoyant were the phone calls coming in for glaucoma, drops, renewals, what about my pressure uh, and so forth, and the ocular surface. Either A, people are on the Zoom calls all day long, having computer dry syndrome, exacerbating their ocular surface, not blinking enough. We saw a worsening of MGD, more hyperim glitz, lots of styes. My God, we saw like 10, 20 styes a week, uh, lots of blepharitis. Uh, and then when the mask came out and the mask mandates that people, you know, luckily followed, especially in our area, uh, we saw a lot of patients not ventilating their ocular surface well. And it's like you'd fog up your, your glasses, you'd fog up your ocular surface. So we saw an exorbitant amount of ocular surface disease from all the things that I mentioned and mentioned this call, predominantly worsening of dry eye worsening of allergy. Allergy was worse, maybe not the nasal symptoms because they were wearing a mask or the respiratory symptoms, but in allergy season, because they had a mask and a poorly ventilated ocular surface, it was horrible. So we've seen an exacerbation and we've locked in those patients and we've grown our practice. Our practice, two biggest growth drivers the last year and a half, exacerbated by COVID and the, the, the commerce of COVID have been glaucoma and ocular surface but ocular surface for sure uh, has grown leaps and bounds because of COVID. And this mask and the fact that people like we are <laughs> the last hour have been staring at each other 
<laughs> Zoom calls and so forth. Yeah. Some folks are on it professionally, six, seven hours a day. Some people are bored and or watching Netflix or, you know, um, you know, Ted Lasso for three, four hours on their iPads and they're not blinking. So yes, for all the above, a big growth opportunity and growth driver practice. We just hired an optometrist a year ago out of fellowship and she has been so busy taking care of the ocular surface patient and those comorbid diseases that we've talked about earlier in the hour. Chris, have you seen an increase in um, New York City, the epicenter of COVID in <laughs> terms of mask wear and exacerbation of dry eye, similar to what Jay uh, was commenting about? Uh, yeah, one, 100%. And it's multifactorial, as Jay was saying, a lot of it is the computer and the computer vision syndrome and staring and not blinking. And it would be, it would be an interesting study to, 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 to go through these videos and actually measure, we, we can measure our, our blink rates. Our right? blink we, rates. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I'm, I'm going to get a That's your next study, <laughs> Chris. I can gonna, see it. <laughs> it would be so easy. And the, the, the amount of data that we could generate from a year and a half of Zoom calls would be uh, phenomenal. But uh, yes, that's part of the problem. And of course, you know, we do, I've got a fan in here blowing and I, you know, I'm trying to direct it away from my eyes, but occasionally it hits me in the eyes and I can feel my contact. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, it happens to everybody and, and we can all relate to this because it happens to us too. Um, but also the masks, um, uh, not only do the masks, you know, the, the air blowing back into your eyes, it's almost like, you know, it's like having a fan, you know, when you're breathing and, and you know, moving air is hitting your eye from your mask. I mean, it is, it's like having a fan on in your eyes all day. That, that, that's unique you know, to the post COVID world. And then also a lot of times when people put their, and this happens to me too, you put your mask on and like the mask hits your open eye, right? So you're getting like micro erosions all day too from, uh, from the mask and the dirty mask. Or the mask rides up. Yeah. And it rides up or you look down and you mm -hmm. get, you hit it, you know, mm -hmm. it's just not good for the ocular surface. Uh, and about the only good thing that has come from the post COVID uh, era are people looking to get out of their glasses, right? So the at least refractive surgery volume has gone up because nobody can stand wearing glasses, you know, and masks. So that, that's been a good thing, but everything else has been terrible. And there have been a bunch of um, different theories to hypothesize why chalasia and hordeola have become so common. Eric, what do you think is the like main cause or the main culprit? Well, I, I think that um, chalasia and are uh, related to the normal lipids not melting at body temperature. And I think that there's an epidemic in our country of poor eating habits, which is kind of the the linchpin to why patients are getting more, more chalazia, that they just don't consume enough uh, unsaturated fats, they don't have enough omega-3s in their diet. But in addition to that, there's a lack of blinking that takes place. And the reason that the patients don't blink as much as they're glued to their computers and cell phones and uh, uh, smart devices. And if you ever want to enjoy yourself, go into a Starbucks and watch someone uh, looking at their uh, iPad there and you, they'll go minutes without blinking. And if you're not blinking, you're not forcing the myobum out the way you should be. So I think it's nutritional. I think it's also um, um, significantly plays a role in, in our lack of blinking because of uh, smart devices that we have. And then the other things like, like aging and hormonal change also play a role as well. And this is where I think um, oral supplements with omega-3s and a moisture heated mask with Bruder and different um, in-office treatments and at-home remedies to kind of relieve the inspissated glands really play an important role. Well, we have one last question and we're going to go around. The hour is almost up. We have been so fortunate that dry eye is now a very sexy field. There's a lot happening in dry eye. A lot of innovations are coming to our area. So I'm going to start with you, Eric. What innovations or new things in the pipeline are you looking forward to um, having access to using in your practice for your patients? There are so many exciting things that are coming. Um, we have talked about Tarsus and Lodaliner for treating Demodex blepharitis. Boy, that, that, that could be a game changer. There's another great company called Azura that has a seborrheic uh, medication that helps open the, the oil glands that are blocked. 
I'm working with a company called Oculus that has a, uh, a tissue necrosis factor alpha uh, inhibitor that um, not only is very effective for dry eye, but it's been found to have genetic phenotypes. For the first time, we can actually look at the gene pool and determine who's going to respond and who's not going to respond. Um, uh, we have Oyster Point uh, that uh, just has uh, their new uh, cholinergic spray that's going to improve tear flow. So, so many good therapies that are out there and so many new ones that are coming. I couldn't even go through the whole list of new devices and treatments that are coming, but we have some good ones now and we have a lot more good ones coming. And the fact that there are so many good therapies that are coming tells you that dry eye is just an important disease we should all pay attention to. Very well said. Chris, I'm going to go to you. What new innovations either that was were recently uh, made available or in the pipeline are you looking forward to? Yeah, yeah, I would echo everything that uh, Eric said. I do think that uh, the Tarsus product is uh, especially uh, exciting because Demodex is a very, you know, right now we have no really good treatment. Um, and it's a very uncomfortable topic to bring up and to make the diagnosis and, and talk to patients about having mites in their eyelids. Uh, never a fun thing, especially when you don't have a good treatment for it. Um, so that's exciting. And, I, and as Eric said earlier, the, the data looks quite good there. Uh, the Oyster Point nasal spray, I think, you know, it's, it's approved. Hooray, hurrah. You know, that's fantastic. It's brand new. Uh, so I don't have a lot of clinical experience with it yet, but extremely thrilled to be able to offer that to patients. Another sort of paradigm shift in the area and another sort of not very novel, very different treatment for those patients who may have maybe failing, you know, the traditional, more traditional treatments. Uh, so that's a big one. And then of course the, the pipeline. And that is, one can be used with contact lenses in place, Chris. That's right. That's yeah, a that's, big advantage. So go ahead. That's one of the few things we have. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, I think um, the pipeline, as Eric was saying, is, is in, in insanely robust. In fact, it's very hard to keep track of all these things. You need to have a PhD to kind of remember all these molecules and what they do. But I do think the Oculus, I think uh, Aldera has a very um, uh, promising uh, drug in the pipeline for both dry eye and allergy, uh, you know, the same product for both. Um, the Airy uh, company has uh, something that works on cold thermoreceptors of the cornea and can modulate uh, in a novel way, you know, uh, treatment for dry eyes and maybe pain sensations as well. Uh, so, um, and then there are a zillion others, which I'm, you know, uh, I'm probably forgetting, but the, the pipeline is robust. The area, you know, it, it just goes to show you how exciting this, you know, I, and I could think ocular service disease really is a unique subspecialty within ophthalmology. I mean, it, there's so much going on. There's so much coming there's so much to learn and and to know and to adopt and to that you know to to really do it at at one of the, at the highest level you almost have to dedicate yourself uh, or somebody in your practice uh, but it's 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 fantastic which is why I love this so much and and the, the pipeline is 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 tremendous I agree. I believe it is a subspecialty onto itself, just like glaucoma. You yes. really can be passionate. And the reward, like you mentioned, Jay, is huge. And you mentioned, Chris, for the patients who come in so, so burdened by their or despondent actually with their dry eye symptoms. And if you help them, the reward is incredibly strong. I agree. So Jay, you're um, the last in this cycle. Any specific products that you're excited about down the road? Well, we're talking about disruption. I think Eric and, um, and Chris have done a really good job at, at letting some of the companies that are out there on the pharmaceutical space. Uh, I'm also a big believer in access to care. So I, I definitely want to see uh, more interventions out there besides the pharmaceuticals. There's almost so much pharmacy you can do on the ocular surface. So hopefully some more devices that come out, a more of an interventional aspect. But again, only affording that for four or five patients a week for us in our practice is not enough. We have to have managed care and the insurance companies creating that disruption, allowing more patients to access the care that we give and innovation in our offices. Um, so for me, all the drugs they mentioned are great. Um, and I see that, you know, inflammation used to be a steroid, then as an immunomodulator, but some of the companies that, that the two have mentioned really target some of those inflammatory medias that are, that are specific for that. 
With that's going to come more point of care diagnostics and looking at all the things that cause it and maybe using some AI to identify that 58 year old golfer that has red hyperemic lids. Is there AI systems that'll help us identify quicker and precociously what kind of disease they have, then afford a good treatment, maybe pharmaceutical, maybe interventional with good access to care. That'll put us in a better place. I think Ocular Service right now is the iPhone 6 of where it should be. We could be the iPhone 14 or the iPhone 20. So bravo to the industry for supporting these great conversations, uh, the innovation we see at all the meetings, the myriad meetings a year. And I think uh, as long as there's demand and patience and consumerism, uh, there'll always be innovation in the market. And we look forward to all of us and our colleagues out there in helping spearhead that. Great. Well, with that, I want to say thank you to Eric, Chris, and Jay. Great comments. I've learned so much from all of you. And thank you to our sponsors to make this happen. <laughs> thank you to the ophthalmologist. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you uh, so much for taking the time uh, to, to kind of join this uh, debate. It was a fantastic discussion. Thank you. Thanks again to our sponsors, Sight Sciences, to Bruder Imprimus, um, to Quidel and to Tarsus. Thanks for your support. Just want to remind everyone that this roundtable will actually be available uh, to anybody uh, who wants to revisit any of the topics of discussion today, it'll be available on the ophthalmologist website. We are also publishing an ebook, so make sure you're registered to receive emails from us and watch out for that in your inboxes. So uh, the only thing that's left for me is to say thank you again to our wonderful panel for a fantastic uh, discussion and to wish you all goodbye and thank you from the ophthalmologist. Thanks.